All right. Uh, so ignore these slides. I always put three of them at the beginning so I can practice using the clicker and the mouse and not reveal half of the opening of my slideshow. So always test your slides before presenting. Okay. All right, well, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Kyle Drager, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've attended Stir Trek for a number of years, and to be able to be here presenting is quite an honor. So I'm very excited to have you all with me here today. So some of you might be surprised to see me looking like this. I believe this was my caricature that was sent out with this year's materials. And these were done by the very talented Nate Lovett. And I'm really appreciative that he stopped drawing me below the neckline because the accentuated manliness of my face almost gives off the impression that I look like this in real life. <laughs> in reality, I'm working with a little bit more of a pre-Spider-Man Peter Parker build. We're given what we got. so But I appreciate Nate Lovett um, doing such great artwork for us. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm the lead UX designer at a company called Patriot Software. We, we uh, create online software solutions for small businesses. We do payroll, accounting, time in HR, and then we also work with recruiters as they make placements between people's company, uh, people, companies, and jobs. And I really enjoy getting to see both of these groups because if you think about payroll managers, they might only log in once a week to actually run payroll whereas our recruiters are logging in every day to use the application. So a variety of different usage styles from these two groups. Uh, also, a little plug, we are hiring, so if you're curious about any of this stuff, come talk to me afterwards. To finish up, a few last little bits. I grew up on a small farm in Rootstown, Ohio, which is up near Akron. In the top right is my lovely wife. In the bottom right is our lovely demon. She's, she's a cute little dog, but she does wreck some havoc throughout our apartment. Uh, I grew up in Rootstown. I went to the University of Mount Union, where I majored in computer science and English writing. And I also firmly believe that eating any sort of breakfast food other than waffles is a complete and utter waste of your time. So if I see one of these in the morning, it gets me thumbs up, dancing, party time. Uh, also, in the spirit of waffles, if you tweet at Drigger throughout this talk with the hashtag waffles, I have some giveaways I'll be giving out at the end, so feel free to do so. So I titled this talk after Ernest Hemingway. Who in here has actually read any Hemingway before? Okay. So a good number of people have read Hemingway. He's a very prolific, very intentional writer. Uh, and his writing style embodies a lot of the same qualities that we strive for in design. Conciseness, clarity, context. He is a little bit dry and to the point. That's one of the major criticisms that new readers to his work often give me. But I think that his very straightforward style is kind of what we try and do when we design as little interface as possible. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But my main goal today is to try and convince you that designers, front-end designers, graphic designers, user experience designers, we should all be learning how to write. And we should be working on those skills. And we want to really build these up because I think there are some very interesting future interaction models that are coming where writing is going to play right into our hands if we have those skills ready. But first, the current state of the industry, it is an a fantastic time to be a designer. There are so many tools available uh, from the ones like Sketch, which we really love at Patriot, to Affinity, a new, uh, a new component which does both video and photo editing, to even Adobe, the old faithful, getting ready to release their new UX prototyping tool. There's no shortage of apps out there for us to add realism, context, and animation to our designs. However, although I really enjoy using a lot of these tools, uh, I believe that the pen is mightier than the pen tool, and that one of the most underutilized and powerful tools that we have in our arsenal is the ability to write, edit, and proof. So where is this coming from? You know, I already gave away my hand that I do have a degree in English, so is this just my opportunity to try and persuade you that the English major is a worthwhile endeavor? Partially, yes. but. 
Additionally, we're looking down the road and I see two different interaction models that are getting a lot of attention. And these are voice and then chat-based interaction models. So we're gonna start with looking at voice-based interaction. Now, if you go back in time with me to 2008, 2009, um, consumers didn't really have that much trust in voice recognition technology, and we'll see that here. Dear mom, comma. <laughs> Fix ant. <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> Delete that. I think it's picking up a little bit of echo here. Delete, select all. <laughs> So not a lot of confidence if that's what we're demoing at conferences, right? Uh, but back in 2011, things were starting to change a little bit. Apple unveiled the iPhone 4S, and the headlining feature of this S variant of iPhone was your new personal, personal assistant named Siri. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that Siri was actually originally an app itself on the App Store before Apple acquired the company that designed it. And then 22 months later, it actually found its way into the 4S. But if you were one of those people using Siri or Google Now or another voice recognition software, the experience was a little lacking. And these services were marketed extremely well, but you have undoubtedly seen commercials like this. Do you think it will snow today? It sure looks like snow today. Say hello to Siri on the most amazing iPhone yet. Now, the important thing to pick out of this little commercial is that right there. Okay, so not only were commands frequently misunderstood, the time it took to parse those commands left a noticeable delay between the speaker and the software. And although interacting with software using our voice was very intriguing, our first few shots at designing the ideal Jarvis-like AI and voice recognition was falling a little flat. But I believe that's changing. Uh, it's changing fast. If you look at the current offerings from Google Now, the current incarnation of Siri, and actually it was very fun because the presentation before mine dealt specifically with the Amazon Echo, so this played wonderfully right into my hand. Uh, voice technology has gotten pretty good, and it's gotten so impressive that we're seeing brand new ways to interact with our devices. This is an app that was announced a couple of months ago, but it's called Hound, and it's got one of the most impressive demos of voice technology that I've been able to find. What's the monthly payment on a $1.2 million home with 20% down, paid over 30 years with a 3.95% interest rate? Your monthly mortgage payment is $4,555.56. What's the status and arrival terminal of the United flight from San Francisco to New York today at around 2 p.m.? Found eight matches for United Airlines flight from San Francisco to New York either departing or arriving on February 26th, the most relevant one based on your proximity to the departure airport, and the current time seems to be United Airlines flight 706 which is scheduled to arrive at Terminal C, and is estimated to depart in 59 seconds. So, quite the departure from the first word processing example I gave. So, but how does this all relate back to designers, right? Because it can be easy to look at voice-based technology and not necessarily see the connection that we have with it. But we're starting to see interfaces that have no interface. You're interacting specifically with your voice. And because verbal communication is so convenient and high bandwidth for the user, I really think we're gonna see a lot of this, and we already are, particularly over the next couple of years. And for the designer, it becomes incredibly risky. We no longer have an interface to display the information, and the services that we design are going to rest on the strength of the writing that we're able to put into them. Uh, particularly as these voice interfaces make their way into the car, into hospitals, and things like that, the onus is on us to design language that is clear, concise, and intuitive. So these are just the two mediums that we're seeing a lot of attention in. Voice was one of them. And the other one I want to talk about requires no voice at all to interact with, and that is chat. So how many people here have interacted with some form of a chat bot or messaging app, maybe in Slack, maybe your bank, things like that? Okay. 
As we begin to see the proliferation of text interfaces, uh, again, we're left without any of the common design tools that we normally use to design those interactions. And we're starting to see an explosion of apps and services that utilize this medium. This is an app called Quartz. Quartz is a news publication, and they recently just released this app. This is how they imagine we'll consume the news in the future. It's very conversational. You're given two little prompts down at the bottom, one to essentially get more info on the story and another one to advance it. We're also going to be able to order pizza over the chat interface in the future as well. Um, my colleagues had encouraged me to try and order a pizza and then have it delivered here midway through the speech, but um, I'm not going to do that. So learning how to work with language is going to be incredibly important for designers because that's kind of where the puck is going as far as a lot of the interactions that we'll have with our users. The current market for chat-based services is getting huge, too. We've seen recently Facebook Messenger open up their platform so that people can build services on top of the existing 900 million people that use it. Uh, undoubtedly, some of you have heard about Slack. Slack's actually being used this year at StirTrek as kind of a group messaging app. It's very well designed. But you can see here we've got Zoho Expense. We've got uh, Dig Bot for Social and Fun. People are really trying to get creative with how we interact with their services in a primarily text-based medium. And most recently at the, the recent build conference, Microsoft unveiled Skype bots, same type of idea, and then an actual back-end cognitive services API that you can integrate into your existing application. So if there's an app for that was the colloquialism of the past five years, I think begun the bot wars have can be this current one. But is this just a fad? You know, because we've seen trendy things in design come and go before, and I don't think so. And if you look around the world, this has actually happened before. The U.S. is about a year or two behind, and to know where we're going, we're going to look to China. WeChat in China is a messaging app that's very similar to a number of the offerings we have today. However, it differentiates itself because it has absolutely dominated the market share over in China, and it has established itself as the de facto platform on which to build this next generation of services. To give you an idea of just how prolific WeChat is in China, this was from the Financial Times just earlier this year, and it says, WeChat has surged to become pr practically synonymous with the smartphone in China. With 650 million monthly active users, overall China has 668 internet users. Just let that sink in for a second, how much of the market share WeChat has permeated. And people are doing really cool stuff with this. You can go and sit down at a restaurant, scan a QR code, and then when you're done, you can text your payment to the restaurant and leave. And that's because WeChat has integrated everything from your credit cards and banks to your social services to actually interacting with the physical locations that you visit. Now, it's easy to kind of draw a comparison between WeChat and Facebook Messenger in the United States because Facebook has a similar market share over here. But Facebook Messenger is still very much an infant compared to WeChat's established and mature service layer that it offers to companies and services. Uh, to put it another way, you can think of it like this. 650 million users all interacting with services primarily through text. WeChat has become an operating system for a lot of new smartphone users in China. To dig a little bit more into this and why I think it's incredibly important we pay attention to this trend, uh, we're going to jump to this guy. And this is Dan Grover. He's a project manager at WeChat. And he postulates that we're going to see a WeChat effect in the United States uh, for a couple of reasons. But two of the most uh, important ones that he points out are you get the same interaction with the service over text without the bloat of downloading an app. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, I think across the industry, we've started to see the slight bloating from web pages to app downloads to a number of other digital things that we interact with. Uh, let's go back in time to Doom. Did anybody here play Doom? OK. Doom, the entirety of Doom, was 2.3 megabytes compressed when you downloaded it from you know, some shareware server. And so I went out and looked around. 
And I found a website that was uh, published an article recently, ironically enough, on the best practices for increasing website performance. And it weighed in at 3.1 megabytes in size. And this isn't an isolated case. You can look across any number of news sites. Uh, a lot of it has to do with advertising. A lot of it has to do with people not managing the size of the assets that get included with their content. But when you think about all of the people who don't necessarily have the broadband 4G LTE speeds, developing countries, and even some parts of the United States, additionally, carriers are starting to crack down on this idea that you can have unlimited data. They're starting to squeeze a little bit more, trying to get you to downgrade to one of their more tiered plans. Uh, just this past couple weeks, I was paying attention to some of the updates that I get in the App Store. And it caused me to actually turn off allowing apps to update in the background while I'm on the go. This is a snapshot of that screen. I have a journaling app, which weighed in at 48 megabytes. A to-do list app, which weighed in at 38. Uh, Starbucks, some weird reason, has 71 megabytes worth of stuff inside of it. Uh, Dropbox has 78. That's not my data, that's theirs. And Square Cash has 31. This is the most perplexing of all of the ones I've just shown you. Has anybody used Square Cash? It's essentially two screens. One, to say how much you're going to pay your friends, and two, to see uh, who you've paid in the past. I'm not sure where 31 megabytes worth of stuff is coming from. And then Slack with 49. But for us to really take advantage of some of the upcoming technologies in design, I think text is going to be there on the forefront because it's a lot easier sell to be able to interact with your services over text as opposed to having to go and download a 100 megabyte application just to order a pizza or to get the news. Uh, the second reason that Grover gives that he thinks WeChat is the effect is going to come to the United States is that messaging works better as a notification system. So a lot of times I open my phone and it's littered with little red dots and I have to go into every single one to see what the notification is if I missed it on the home screen. And messaging as a concept works a lot better for managing these types of notifications because everything is threaded. You're combining both your interactions and the notifications that you have with a service into one archivable and searchable thread. And you can pin the threads, you can block them, you can mute them. It's a better way of thinking about the way that we interact with services rather than them just telling you, hey, you have something you need to check out. Uh, while we're on the topic of messaging as an interface, I think it's important to stop and talk about conversational UI. This is one of the paradigms that is kind of, oh, I'm sorry, paradigms that has come up with messaging interfaces. And conversational UI is the idea of having the computer's response be very conversational and flowery and add in those little characteristics that make it seem more human. Injecting personality and so forth. This is a screenshot from, does anybody? War games? OK. <laughs> well done, well done. OK. So conversational UI has become a bit of a sticking point when designers talk about uh, designing these types of text interfaces. And the reason being that it feels like we're just doing a gimmick or a fad for the user. We're not necessarily designing the best version of our service. And Mr. Grover, the WeChat project manager, actually goes into this in his piece a little bit. He says that a number of the early WeChat messaging services started very conversationally. And then as the design and the products matured, you saw them showing less conversation and more information. So that might be something to keep in mind when we're looking at these types of services. Another common criticism is that messaging apps are primarily just a modern phone tree, right? You text and you get a response with a list of options, and then you have to pick that option, and it's this nice volley back and forth between the user and the service. And that's a fair criticism on one hand, but I think it's a little short-sighted on the other. Because the number one issue I have with phone trees as an information delivery system is that I have to sit there and listen to every option as it's read to me in a far too cheery tone for the Time Warner Cable customer service. No offense if anybody works at Time Warner Cable. <laughs> but you have to wait for every option to be sent to you one at a time. It's not the same with text-based interfaces, however, because all options can be presented at once, 
And if you're a little smart about it, you can also provide the user with some quick, actionable items at the bottom of those messages. Uh, Telegram and Facebook are both doing this in their applications. Telegram actually sends back two buttons based on the type of response they're sending. They know that you'll be taking one or two actions. And Facebook does this as well. So if that's the future, you know, what's the conversation going on now? Because we've talked about voice interactions, we've talked about text-based, and we see that WeChat is a dominant force in China, and I think it's laying out the trends that we're going to see over the next couple of years in the United States. So I want to talk a little bit about what's been said, because this isn't just about the future of design. Design and writing has been talked about for a long time in our industry. I'm going to start with a designer named Mig Reyes, who led brand and marketing at Basecamp, formerly 37 Signals, for four years before heading off to become, now he's the director of design at a company called Talk, which does high-end restaurant bookings. But back when he was at Basecamp, he wrote the following post, design is still about words. And ironically enough, he did not include a lot of words in this post. He included mostly images. And as we look through his piece, we see that he has stripped away text from a number of popular websites. And although the character of the website remains intact, it's very clear how much our designs rely on the structure that the text and copy we're putting on them provide. Another designer, his name is Justin Jackson, he wrote an essay a couple years ago that got a lot of attention. And it was just an essay titled Words. And Words is an 801 byte not even kilobyte, certainly not megabyte, an 801 byte essay, four CSS rules, it's completely responsive, perfectly readable, and in it, he la he's lamenting the lack of focus that a lot of websites have nowadays. And it goes into issues such as the size of the web page, how we're seeing an overuse of hero images and a huge CTA in the middle of the page. We've all seen websites like this. And to quote him from his piece, he says, at the heart, web design should be about words. Words don't come after the design is done. Words are the beginning, the core, and the focus. And he's trying to argue that the web is really good at getting information to the user quickly. And one of the best ways we have to do that is through words. So writing should be an important part of your skill set. Finally, Daniel Burka, he is a design partner at Google Ventures. He also helped author Sprint. Uh, has anybody heard of Sprint before? It's a new process. A few hands go up. It's relatively new. But Sprint is Google Ventures' take on, like they say on the book, solving big problems, testing new ideas, and doing it in just five days. You'll essentially take a project from idea to prototyped and tested with users in a week. And we actually did this at Patriot a week and a half ago, and it worked out really well. It was some of the most difficult work we've ever done, try prototyping an entire onboarding flow in just a couple of hours on a Thursday. But we tested it with users, and we got some really great data back. So if you're interested at all in this process, um, come and talk to me. But on the topic of design and writing, uh, Daniel Burka had this to say. Most designers consciously know writing is important, but too often we only pay lip service to it. If I drew a designer's skill map, I'd make writing, editing, and proofing a third of the diagram. A third of our skill set. I just want to let that sink in for a second. What would it look like at your jobs if you spent roughly a third of your time working on your editing, your proofing, and your writing skills? For some of us, it might look quite a bit different. But I don't just want to tell you what the conversation is and where I think it's going. I want to give you where to start. Uh, some of you may be on board with me, and so I've put together a few places that I think are ripe for writing integration in your projects. And the first one we're going to start with is a darling of anybody who's done any sort of design, this guy. What is this? Lorem Ipsum. It's been so pervasive in the design community that we've seen it remixed into a very inappropriate uh, Samuel L. Jackson Ipsum, which he pulls a lot from Quentin Tarantino movies in that one, but it's also quite funny. But Lorem Ipsum. So for those who aren't aware, Lorem Ipsum is the widely used uh, 
Latin text that you use as a placeholder when you want people to focus on the overall design of a page and typography and maybe not necessarily the content. It allows the designer to kind of skip past the writing and just focus on the design, which is fine and it has its place, but there are many times where I see lorem ipsum making its way further and further down the prototyping process. And sometimes you even have lorem ipsum in your development applications and things like that. And so as user experience designers, as front end designers, as anybody who's designing the interface and working with what the user is going to be interacting with, one of the best things we can bring to our designs is context of the situation that the user will be in when they're using our products. So why would we throw away the opportunity to inject realism into our products, even at the most early mock-up stages? To that end, I feel that writing should be a part of your prototyping process from the beginning. This is going to give you an opportunity to refine and iterate on things like voice, tone, and empathy in your writing, much like you do in design. So let's take a quick example here. Pretend you've been asked to add an email contact form to the bottom of your web page. So you mock up a subject line and a body for the user to type in, and you throw some lorem ipsum in there because you want to see what it looks like, and you're showing this off to all the people involved. They might say that's a perfectly fine contact form. We'll put it at the bottom. But what if you were to take just five to 10 minutes of your time and go talk to maybe customer support and say, what sort of emails have we gotten in the past? Or maybe you write your own, and you replace the lorem ipsum with this. Suddenly, just by actually putting possible potential content in there, you've added a level of context to how this form is actually going to be used. Now, anybody who sees this, stakeholders, programmers, others involved in the project, they'll be able to understand what the user might be doing with this part of the application or website. And I think it's important that I'm not saying you should stop using lorem ipsum entirely. I'm just saying we should take a do-it-yourself approach to placeholder content. So even if you don't consider yourself a good writer, and I don't consider myself a good writer either, I don't think any writer considers themselves a good writer. Even if you're brand new to it, take 10 minutes and just try and write out the copy that you would otherwise use lorem ipsum for the next time you have the opportunity. Even 10 minutes of your time will yield more contextual, beneficial language than any Latin nonsensical grammar could. And this gets really powerful when you start integrating this with your team, maybe sharing a Google document, and you're all collaborating on a library of filler content, but content that actually adds some context and realism to your designs. In the same way that you can't just sprinkle on UX or design at the end of a project, I strongly feel you can't do the same with writing. It should be a part of the process from the beginning. It can't be an afterthought. It should be one of the first thoughts for your designs. To that end, let's pretend you're meeting someone new. And when you're in that situation, you are extremely sensitive to a lot of other little factors that we're not normally uh, thinking about at that time. There's a whole psychology behind first impressions. The saying goes, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And we go through this with new users to our sites all the time, and we're talking about onboarding, user onboarding. So aside from the visual presentation of your app, onboarding also provides a great podium for you to establish the voice of your brand. The way you walk a user through sign up, through their first steps, getting their account set up, anything like that, can help set the tone for their next interactions with your service. So one of my favorite sites on the internet about this topic is called useronboard.com. It's by a designer named Samuel Hullock in Portland, Oregon. And on his site, he has onboarding teardowns for many popular websites and apps, including Apple Music, which if you ever went through this onboarding process, it was pretty terrible. It actually took you out of the app multiple times, and you had to relaunch it to get your account all set up. But this is kind of his visual style, too. He'll go through each screen of the app, and he'll mark it up with little bubbles, pointing to things that maybe weren't so clear, and he'll write in some suggestions as well. And he's got tons of these on the site. Uh, like I said, Apple Music. He's done Snapchat, and even the more business-oriented ones like Gmail. 
So after reading through several of these case studies, however, you'll find that the ones where he had the least amount of trouble and where the onboarding seemed particularly clear was where it was obvious the language had been given some attention and thought. It was edited, it was conscientious, and above all, it was consistent. Why waffles? Well, you'll see. But consistency, we're gonna take a break and just talk about consistency for one second. Um, in school, although no English major will ever tell you, uh, but I'm about to, you're allowed to break any grammatical rule you want. You just have to be consistent. Got milk is grammatically incorrect, but they're consistent with their message and they're on point every time they use it. And so to that end, it works. So you're allowed to break any grammatical rule you want, just be consistent. And sometimes it's the smallest copy that makes the biggest difference. Uh, my favorite example of this is an essay in 2013 by designer Dustin Curtis, and he was talking about the differences between calling something my or your in the interface. So we're talking about labeling user content. So is it my settings or your settings? My profile, your profile, et cetera. And to be honest, I've seen sites that kind of use these words somewhat interchangeably. However, in his piece, Dustin Curtis argues that each word carries a connotation for the type of relationship the user will actually have with the service. So, I'm trying to do a bit of word image association here. Consistency, even on the smallest levels of your app, can make a big difference down the road. And the conclusion that Curtis came to is that my, when you label something my profile, my settings, you're actually telling the user that this service is meant to be an extension of themselves. You're promoting the sense that it's an extension of them. When you say your settings, your profile, things like that, it's more conversational in tone and your interface takes on a bit of a personality. Uh, between these two, I tend to side more with the your camp. I think that interfaces should be a bit more conversational with the user and I don't think our services necessarily are an extension of the user themselves. So I tend to side more with the your side of things. But they're two tiny words, but being consistent in their usage can have much larger effects than you might think. So consistency. Next time you have breakfast, you're going to think of this talk. So call it pop, call it soda, just be consistent. Use the Oxford comma or don't, just be. You know, it's rare that I find myself with an audience and a chance to espouse the virtues of the Oxford comma. So we're going to take a small detour as I quickly demonstrate why the Oxford comma should be both used and loved. For the uninitiated, the Oxford comma is the inclusion of a comma before the and in a list of three things or more. So right there. Star Trek is fun, comma, educational, comma, and exciting. Now in this particular example, the Oxford comma does little to keep the sentence more or less clear. So you could leave it out if you wanted. But why would you just make a habit of including it always? Because to leave it, leave it out is tempting fate. Tempting fate that one day you will be disastrously misunderstood. When asked who he was inviting to his birthday party, Tony Stark tweeted that he was inviting his two best friends, Captain America and the Hulk, and some other losers. And this is what he tweeted. B-Day invites going out to some losers, comma, Captain America and Hulk. However, Tony didn't include the Oxford comma. By the laws governing dependent clauses, the losers he's referencing can be interpreted as none other than Captain America and the Hulk. And guess who sees this? <laughs> and guess what happens next? <laughs> Yet another reason good writing is important, and I bet you didn't know that little bit about the Marvel Universe. But going back to places I think are kind of ripe for writing integration, uh, one of the most awesome sources of potential you have is in your emails to customers. Uh, how many of you have designed an email template in the past? It's almost a little bit of a rite of passage for designers. Um, and unfortunately, emails tend to be the junk drawer for a lot of the writing and copy that we create. But let's consider the context of an email for a second. The user is no longer in your app. They're no longer on your website. You've come to them. You've come into their inbox, their home, their private space. So shouldn't we be particularly cautious and careful when designing the language that that message entails? 
There's so much untapped potential for good copy in emails that MailChimp actually has a whole site dedicated to highlighting some of the best ones. And it's very cleverly named reallygoodemails.com. But this is a great site. Uh, they go into some of the best practices for writing in emails. They also break it down by category. So if you want to see what a really great apology email looks like, they have an example for that. And similarly with alerts and accounts and automation and things like that. It's a really great site. You should check it out. And if you just browse through some of these, I'm absolutely sure it will spark some inspiration for things that you can word differently in your emails, even the transactional ones that you're conducting between yourself and the users. So that's great. And we've gone over kind of where we think it's going, what's been said now, what we can do. But there's still this overlooming question of so what, right? I understand it's not easy for a lot of us to just start writing at your job. So if that's the case, or even if it's not, I have a few things that you personally can start doing right now to help build up those skill sets of writing, editing, and proofing. And we're going to start with my Pinterest board. So I actually really like Pinterest. Um, I use it as a mood board. Uh, uh, mood board, does everybody know what that is generally? No? OK. Well, a mood board is a way for generally my wife and all her friends to collect all the things she would like me to buy across the internet. So we're talking about baskets. We're talking about succulents. We're talking about things for the kitchen. And you can collect all these visual inspiration and put them into one cohesive package. Designers tend to use mood boards more for collecting typography, animation, and anything that jumps out to us that we think was particularly well done or interesting. And they work great because they let you see things that are isolated in different parts of the internet and see them together. And maybe two things by themselves didn't spark inspiration, but seeing them next to each other will. I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction and say that you should do the same with language that you find interesting. So a mood board for language. A language board, a language log, a spark file. It's been called a lot of different things. But anytime you're reading or watching a TV show, listening to a presentation, or you hear something really great on a podcast, any sentence, paragraph, or word, I just want you to grab that while you're in the moment and put it in your language log. Over time, you'll begin to amass a collection of language examples that were clear, intuitive, beautiful even, or maybe they were just really enjoyable to read. And much like the mood board, as this library grows for you, you're going to start making connections between different things that aren't necessarily related. You might see two sentences describing two completely different topics, but they sound the same because their tone and cadence are similar. So this is the statistics from my personal language log, mood board for language. I have about 5,500 words in there. And this has been collected over the past couple years. And I sit down and read through it every now and again, because you'll make those connections by looking at the two different isolated sentences or quotes or things that you found. Um, another important thing about this is I strongly encourage you use a plain text file, or you remove all the formatting before you paste it into your document. Um, for no other reason than this is supposed to be about the language itself and not the typography, not the visual design. And sometimes that can distract from what the actual interpretation of the words is supposed to be. Uh, funny story, though. I was recently reading through my own language board and stumbled upon what I consider to be the best opening line in all of literature. When he turned 18, Justin Bieber had a journalist from GQ sent down to do a profile on him. And that, uh, that journalist was Drew McGarry. So Drew McGarry went down to Bieber's home. And how do you start what's about to become a several thousand word essay on one of the most popular cultural icons of this generation? Well, McGarry started it like this. I have been told specifically that I will be able to punch Justin Bieber in the face. <laughs> Poetry in motion, if you ask me. And I don't know why this makes me smile. Perhaps it's the thought of Bieber getting punched in the face. Um, but it's McGarry's right hook before his uppercut of a closing line, which comes almost 3,500 words later. And it's a great essay if you ever want to go and Google and read it. But I love that I have saved this. And you get to see it next to other bits of language that I've saved over the years. 
And part of the way to become a better writer is to pay attention to good writing and good writing that you think is good, not just that somebody else told you is. So that language board can help you do just that. The last little tip that you can do by yourself, which is a bit obvious, I'll admit, but write more to write better. One of the most rewarding habits of my life has been that I've been a regular journaler. Over the years, I've been able to look back and see my tastes change, uh, my opinions mature, and most importantly, by getting into the active daily practice of writing, my writing has improved. And much like we don't sit down in front of Photoshop and immediately know all of the commands to navigate the UI, you're not going to sit down in front of a blank document and be able to type out really great language. It takes practice. And so you want to give yourself every opportunity that you can to do so. If journaling isn't your thing, you can start a blog. If you're afraid of publicity, start a blog. No one will really read it. No one reads mine. <laughs> if you'd rather not go digital, Staples has these for $5, and they come with pens. So you're all done after $5. Um, if you'd like to get a little more into it, because I know designers particularly like to get into the, the tools they use, this is a $25 notebook done by Baron Fig. I have one. It's great. Um, you can use all sorts of different pens. You'll start getting into, like programmers have, which text editor is best. We have, is a fountain pen better than a gel pen? We can get into it as much as we want. Um, like I said, I have one of these. I recommend it. Apple Watch is not included, unfortunately. So the last thing you can do is encourage writing at work and be an advocate to help get writing off the ground at where you're working. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm telling you you should go into the chat room and become the grammar Nazi. Silly slack bot, you messed up restrictive and non-restrictive clauses again. And I'm not advocating that you should become a snob about writing to the point that you create an entire 45-minute presentation about the values of language and as they relate to design. Rather, when you're talking about designing writing with the folks of your business, you can put it this way. You always want your brand to come through consistently in every interaction that the user has with it. Additionally, you can talk about how two of the most sought-after skills in new hires are clear and good written and verbal communication skills. So why don't we use them in the designs of our applications? When talking with your own design team, you can talk about how empathy for our users needs to, extend beyond, need to extend beyond the colors, beyond the grid layouts, and that it should be in our writing. Advocate that it's worth spending the time writing up front because you'll be able to use it down the road. And I'm talking about that custom lorem ipsum document that your team generates as you're creating placeholder content. So I've put together a few resources that can be helpful if you're looking to read more about what I've been speaking on. And the first one that I'm going to show you is the MailChimp Content Style Guide. Now, this is a bit different than a style guide might convey. And I'm just going to read really quickly what they have on the front page. They say, this is our company style guide. It helps us write clear and consistent content across teams and channels. Please use it as a reference when you're writing for MailChimp. This guide goes beyond basic grammar and style points. It's not traditional in format or content. We break a number of grammar rules for clarity, practicality, or preference. So like I said, you can break any rule you want. Just be consistent. The second thing I'm going to recommend is a book called The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. This is the quintessential guide to writing that most writers I know have a copy of in their library. So in the writer's own words, vigorous writing is concise. A sentence should contain no unnecessary words. A paragraph, no unnecessary sentences for the same reason that a drawing should have no unnecessary lines and a machine no unnecessary parts. This requires that the writer not make all his sentences short all, or that he avoid detail entirely. Rather, he treat his subjects and make every word tell. It's a great sentence, by the way. It should go on your language board. Published in 1920, though, this little 43-page book is the summation of why clear and concise writing can make a difference. And so they've got tons of examples in there. It's a very easy read. And I actually have a copy with me that I'll be giving away to anyone who's tweeted out through the presentation or if you come and meet me down here before we're done and ready for lunch. The last book that I'll recommend is a little unconventional, but it's fantastic. It's Thing Explainer by Randall Monroe. 
Um, if you're familiar with Randall Monroe, it's probably through his XKCD comics. This is one of my favorites. If you really believe in the laws of physics, you won't flinch. We've all been in that science classroom where the professor holds the bowling ball up to your nose and lets go, and due to the loss in momentum and energy, it won't hit you, um, except for the kid in my class who stepped forward accidentally. But this book is really great because it takes things and he explains them using only the 1,000 most common words. So to give you an example, he calls a constellation lines we draw to help us remember stars, or molten earth crust as hot rock. It's a really great book, and I think it kind of clarifies how you can take really technical and detailed topics and break them down and still make them understandable, even if you don't have the strongest, most prolific use of the vocabulary in the dictionary. So what's next? We've talked a little bit about the future. We've talked about ways you can get started now. But before I close, I'd like to take a minute just to think about what's next. And I'm not talking about the, the voice or the text-based messaging. I'm talking about what's the step after that. And the way I got started thinking about this is because in 2013, the New York Times put out a quiz called How Y'all Use and You Guys Talk. So this quiz was fantastic and extremely interesting. And as you completed the quiz, the New York Times would try and narrow down which geographic location you got a majority of your vernacular from. So these were some of the questions. What do you call it when rain falls while the sun is shining? I call it, I have no term or expression for this, but apparently people in this country call it the devil is beating his wife, monkey's wedding, fox's wedding, I'm not sure what the difference is there, liquid sun might be my favorite, sun shower, and other. Uh, another example, what do you call a sweetened carbonated beverage? I assume most of us here would probably say, oh, I heard a soda, okay. I call it pop, it's pop, and if you call it anything but pop, you're wrong. <laughs> but apparently people call it Coke, tonic, soft drink, lemonade, that's the weird one. <laughs> lemonade exists in a completely different context, and I don't know, I'd like a lemonade, well, the lemon kind or the soda kind? Uh, Coca-Cola, fizzy drink, dope, uh, and other. And, and one last one, what do you call the thing from which you might drink water in a school? I use drinking fountain and water fountain interchangeably, but bubbler was a new one to me. So like I said, as you completed this quiz, a little map of the United States would show up, and it would show where the Times thinks you were from. And so let's take this idea that everybody talks a little bit differently and apply it to our design and writing. And what I'm thinking about is, will there come a time when we actually adjust our onboarding and copy within the application so that it appeals to the different types of vernacular that people are visiting us with. If you think about it, websites and apps have essentially been using the same vernacular for every visitor, even if they're from different parts of the country. We handle if you're from a different country entirely with localization, but what about within the country itself? Will designing and writing contextual experiences mean taking into account the dialects of our users? Would that just be weird? Maybe. Or would it let our interfaces slip further into the background because the language we're using to communicate is ever so familiar to the users? Something to think about, to be sure. And just really tangentially on the idea of future and design and what's it all going to look like, someone had the audacity to put together this which is your best UI UX practices for VR. And when I read this, I went over into the corner and cried because we're just now getting into some really interesting text-based stuff and now people are gonna wanna do payroll in VR and I'm gonna have to design digital paychecks that they can sign and all of this stuff. But who's to say they won't and who's to say it won't be a better way of doing things like that? But back to the present. We've talked a little bit about areas I think are ripe for design, integration with writing, creating your own lorem ipsum, invest in quality onboarding copy, and don't let your emails go neglected. And finally, we talked a little bit about the language board and ways that you can get started um, today. And I think there's no better quote to end with uh, than this one. No, no, this would go against 
everything I just have told you. So this is actually a quote in English that I translated to Latin. Let's translate it back into English. And every day is a new day. It is better to be lucky, but I would rather be exact. Then when luck comes, you are ready. And I pulled this from Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea. And I said at the beginning of this talk that I titled this presentation after Ernest Hemingway because I believe his writing style embodies a lot of the qualities that we look for when we're trying to design intuitive and simple interfaces. He was a very terse writer, and he used the bare minimum to get his thoughts across. And in that way, his messages were always very clear. So the saying goes that luck's what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And I think the opportunity to work with and design entire new interactions based on text, based on voice, and based on who knows what comes next are coming. But it, now it's up to us to make sure we're prepared for when they do. And one of the best ways we can prepare ourselves is with working on our writing, editing, and proofing skills. So happy writing, and thank you very much. One last plug, we are hiring at my company, if that was at all of interest to you. I am at Drager on Twitter, one more waffle, and you can find my own writing at kqdrager.com. Thank you, everybody. Okay.